30. Order. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this afternoon's meeting of the Public Accounts Committee. We now are in public session. Uh, welcome to today's meeting. And members, mobile phones are set must be set to airplane mode or turned off. It's not sufficient to put phones on uh, mobile. Uh, sorry, silent mode, or they continue to interfere with the assembly recording. This session is being recorded in video and audio and can be accessed via online streaming either the assembly website or Democracy Live. The end item one is apologies. Have we any apologies this afternoon? No. Nope. The end item two then is the minutes of the meeting of the 25th of November 2021, which are pages 9 to 15 of your pack. Are members content that these minutes are an accurate record and have you, uh, your permission to sign them as being accurate? Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. Um, declarations of members' interests. Any members wish to declare a declaration, Mr. Beggs? Yeah. Uh, do you want me to repeat my? Mm -hmm. uh, declare an interest uh, as a committee member of Horizon Sure Start and as a governor of Roddensvale School. Okay, any other members wish to declare interest this afternoon? Mr. Boylan? Yes. Uh, declare an interest as a governor of Clay Primary School in Katie Chair. Okay. Any others? Um, chair, just Cahirla, uh, chairman of Nice Club and Jerica Preschool Provision in Castle Derry. Okay, Mr. Muir. Um, member of the Board of Governors of Priory Integrated College in Hollywood. Okay, um, I declare I'm a, a governor of the Belfast Girls Model and Edinburgh Primary School and a former pupil of the Boys Model. Um, okay, agenda number four then is matters arising from the minutes. Any members, any matters arising? Okay, item five, correspondence. Pages 18 and 19 of your pack. Um, we're delighted to be joined this afternoon by Mr. Kieran Donnelly, CB, the Comptroller and Auditor General, and remotely from uh, the Audit Office by Mr. Kyle Bingham, the Assembly Support Officer. Members, I refer, to, uh, refer you to correspondence pages 18 and 19 of your pack dated the 25th of November from the Clerking and Member Support Office, CAMS, regarding member development and personal security. A one-hour session on Wednesday, the 15th of December, 2021, from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. via Microsoft Teams is being facilitated by the, P the PSNI, which will include a presentation and discussion. Uh, this will also be a session scheduled um, sometime in the new year for party and constituency staff. Members CAMS uh, is hoping to have a good response to this session. And if you wish to um, participate, the contact details in the or in the correspondence, or you can contact the committee team. Okay, members, we will at this stage remain in open session for a recap prior to a further evidence session regarding our inquiry into closing the gap, social deprivation, and links to education attainment. I think at this stage, I understand that um, Rodney Allen from the Northern Ireland Audit Office would like to join the meeting. Rodney, can you see and hear us okay? Yes, I can. Thank you, Chair. Well, good afternoon, Rodney. Um, and so we move then to agenda item six, uh, which is the inquiry into closing the gap, social deprivation, and links to education team attainment. And the recap is pages 21 to 103 of your pack. Uh, joining the meeting is Mr. Donnelly, CB, the Comptroller and Auditor General, Mr. Patrick Barr, Mr. Andrew Allen, uh, Audit Manager, Mr. Kyle Bing, Assembly Sport Officer. Um, before I ask for our uh, visitors this afternoon to be brought in, do any of our uh, elder office team wish to make any contributions or anything before we go into the meeting? Uh, no, there's nothing I think we wish to add that hasn't been already said. Okay. Sure. okay. Um, so, members, before we hear from Dr. Brown, the uh, accounting officer and permanent secretary of the Department of Education, and Sir Long, the chief executive of the Education Authority, already regarding our inquiry into closing the gap social deprivation and the links to education attainment. Um, I want to recap on the work to date. Uh, members, on the 7th of October 2021, the committee took evidence from the department on the issues regarding the Northern Ireland Office report on closing the gap. Then on the 4th of November, 
the committee took evidence from Dr. Noel Purdy, chair of the expert panel regarding the expert panel's report, a first start. In addition, myself, Mr. Beggs and Mr. Muir visited the boys' model on the 4th of November to discuss targeting social need and utilising TSE fun TSN funding. Uh, so the relevant papers in your pack are the cover memo, closing the gap evidence session documents, which includes information on common themes across the evidence sessions, at pages 21 to 24 of your pack, and a revised version of this paper has been an email to members this morning. The Northern Ireland Audit Office uh, closing the gap final report web at pages 25 to 100 of your pack. Closing the gap second issues paper dated the 8th of November, pages 101 to 103. Additional paper in Northern Ireland Audit Office potential questions, three and four of your pack. An additional paper, Clark's draft uh, report, PAC visit the boys model in your table pack, pages 6 to 11. Uh, this will be considered at next week's meeting. Uh, figures and report have now been verified by the school's principal. Um, okay, so if no one has any comment to make at this stage, uh, either members or the Audit Office, uh, we will remain in open session for a further evidence session on our inquiry into closing the gap. And at this stage, I would invite Dr. Mark Brown, the uh, counting officer, the Department of Education, and Mr. Long, the chief executive of the Education Authority, to join the meeting. In addition, joining the meeting via Starleaf are Alison Chambers, Director of Promoting Col uh, Collaboration and Helping Disadvantaged at the Department of Education. Um, Suzanne Kingan, Head of School Improvement, Department of Education. Linda Drysdale, Head of Early Years, the Department of Education. Michael Corky, Director of Education at the Education Authority. Patricia Cooney, Assistant Director of Education at the Education Authority. Um, those who are joining us remotely, can you just confirm to me that you can see and hear us okay? Yes, Chair. Okay. Yes, Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. You're all very welcome. Uh, so, members then, Agenda Item 7, Closing the Gap, Social Deprivation and Links to Education Attainment Evidence Session, pages 106 and 111 of your pack. So at this stage, I welcome um, Dr. Mark Brown, the County Officer and Permanent Secretary of the Department of Education, and Sir Long, the Chief Executive. Uh, of the Education Authority regarding our inquiry, closing the gap. Um, and uh, you're all very welcome this afternoon. Uh, at this stage, uh, I'll hand over to Dr. Brown or Ms. Long in terms of whether well, you want to make an opening statement before we move to questions. Mark, if you go first. Thank you very much, Chair, and good afternoon uh, to, to yourself and the committee. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to talk further about this important report uh, on social deprivation and links to educational attainment. In your invitation letter of 19th of October, Chair, you said that the committee noted the department's observations on the general improvement in attainment and that the department recognised that more needs to be done, but that you would like to explore in greater detail the evidence that supports how the department intends to close the gap in attainment for those from socially deprived areas, and to this end, the identification of good practice is of particular interest to the committee. He also said it would be beneficial to take evidence from the Education Authority, and Sarah and her colleagues are therefore in attendance today. As I emphasised at our previous session, I want to assure the committee that the prime purpose of the Department of Education and the Education Authority is seeking to ensure that every child is able to fulfil their potential. And it's important for our society, our economy and our future uh, that this opportunity is afforded to every child regardless of their circumstances. As the NIAO report highlights at paragraph 319, the educational attainment of all school leavers has increased greatly over the period. From 2006 to 19, the proportion of all school leavers achieving 5 plus GCSEs at grades A start as C, including English and Maths, uh, increased by 18 percentage points from 53% to 71%. And over that same period, the proportion of children entitled to free school meals achieving the same significant benchmark increased by an even larger margin of 24 percentage points, from 26% in 2006 <coughs> to 50% by 2019. And this reduced the gap in attainment between uh, those entitled to free school meals who were leaving school and non-FSME school leavers by three percentage points, or 10%. So, Chair, really good progress has been made in increasing attainment, 
but we recognise that more needs to be done to reduce the differentials between groups. In seeking to maintain <clears throat> the current rate of improvement in attainment and to reduce differentials further between young people from disadvantaged circumstances and other pupils, the Department will continue to implement our core school improvement policy, which is every school a good school. And this policy aims to tackle underachievement and promote the raising of standards and equality in all our schools, enabling every young person to fulfil their potential. <coughs> sorry, sorry, excuse me. Could I ask members to please mute their devices so we don't have the feedback? I did mention that at the start of the meeting. So could you, if you're not speaking, could you mute your device? Sorry, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Uh, at the core of this policy is self-evaluation, leading to sustained self-improvement, combined with a formal intervention process for those schools where the quality of education provision is less than satisfactory. And DE's school improvement policy focuses on promoting the factors that local and international evidence tell us are the core characteristics of a good school. It aims to support school leaders, boards of governors and teachers in implementing good practice in their schools to address any barriers to learning that pupils might face and therefore to improve the outcomes of all pupils. And the policy is centered in six key areas. Effective leadership and an ethos of aspiration and high achievement. High quality teaching and learning. Tackling barriers to learning. Embedding a culture of self-evaluation and self-assessment and of using performance and other information to affect improvement. Support to help schools. And finally, increasing engagement between schools, parents, families and communities. And the policy highlights that the primary responsibility for school improvement rests with schools themselves, which, through effective, evidence-based self-evaluation and planning through the school development plan process, can develop a high-quality educational experience for all pupils. Now, alongside the work of teachers, school leaders, boards of governors and managing authorities, inspection is a critical component of school improvement. Inspection highlights specific areas for improvement and identifies those schools where the overall quality of education is found to be less than satisfactory. And a key element of the school improvement policy is the follow-up on all public school inspection reports and in particular the formal intervention process. In cases where the ETI reports that a school needs to address urgently significant areas for improvement, the policy requires that the school is placed in the formal intervention process to ensure it receives focused support from the EA and in the case of Cathy Mateen Schools, CCMS. And the EA also has an important role in helping to identify schools at risk of underachievement and intervening with appropriate support. So this overarching school improvement policy is supported and supplemented by strategies relating to particular issues of importance, such as, for example, the Count, Read, Succeed strategy, focusing on numeracy and literacy. It is also supplemented and enhanced by specific time-limited or targeted initiatives such as, for example, extended and full-service schools, delivering social change, literacy and numeracy signature programme, the Promoting Improvement in English and Maths project, the North Belfast Primary Principles programme, the Engage programme, and most recently, the First Start initiative. And these initiatives, in turn, sit alongside other system-level policies, such as the Northern Curriculum, our policy in early years and Sure Start, uh, special educational needs, and teacher professional development and are underpinned by the common funding formula and delegated decision-making to schools. So in conclusion, Chair, uh, this combination of policies provides the basis on which the Department of Education supports continual school improvement. Real and significant progress has been made since 2006 in improving educational attainment for all pupils and also for those from disadvantaged circumstances. And as we look to the future, uh, we face significant challenges. Most obviously in managing the impact of COVID day and daily in our schools and in seeking to address the impact this, this has had and will continue to have on the well-being and education of our young people, particularly the most disadvantaged in our society. And this is compounded by the ongoing financial pressure on the education sector as we face into an imminent budget settlement with around £366 million of pressures next year rising to around 543 million in 2024-25. So in this context, maintaining our school improvement policy and delivering on the first start report will be very challenging. In doing so, uh, we will continue to rely on the commitment, the dedication and the professionalism of our school principals, our teachers and our broader uh, education workforce. 
Thank you, Chair. That concludes uh, my comments. Okay. Ms. Long, do you want to anything at this stage? Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon. The Permanent Secretary has provided a comprehensive overview, so I will keep my comments brief. Um, we very much welcome the Closing the Gap report recommendations, as well as the Fair Start report and other important work carried out in this field to ensure that all young people, regardless of background, are well supported to achieve the highest level possible. Reducing underachievement, addressing the attainment gap and ensuring all children and young people have access to supportive and high quality educational opportunities to give them the best possible start in life is a critical priority for the EA, working alongside DE and all our partners. There is a lot of effective and impactful work happening right across our schools and in partnership with those wider sectors, and we know there is more that we can do collectively. I am joined today by my colleagues Michelle Corky and Patricia Cooney, who have joined the EA after many years as school leaders. And during the session, we will look forward to outlining some best practice examples which will very much build the foundations of what we need to do and where we need to go to deliver for all our children and young people. Okay, thank you. Um, as, you as you will have heard, um, we had a very useful uh, and good visit to the boys' model. Uh, and then I recommended to the audit office that they should visit the boys' model, and Mr Allen and his team visited the boys' model then, I think, uh, a couple of weeks after we did. And I think subsequent to that visit, then the head of the civil services also visited the, the boys' model. Um, my suggestion of visiting the boys' model is not, was not because I'm a former pupil and because it's in North Belfast, um, but because um, of the excellent leadership that has been given in that school by the senior management team and the fantastic results that have been achieved there. Um, during our visit, and colleagues will be, will be brought in the moment and can add to this if they wish, but during our visit we were struck by the level of collaboration needed between schools and, and the administrators to target the needs of the, of the individual students. We were hugely impressed by the commitment of the, the staff there, and we got a presentation by the senior management team in, in terms of all of the various elements of that um, delivery. Um, can I ask what systems and mechanisms are in place to ensure that there is collaboration uh, and cooperation between the department and the education authority and schools, in particular school principals, teachers and governors, to ensure that what is needed in terms of what the schools ask and request is, is actually delivered. Happy to, to, to respond in the first instance to that, uh, Chair. Um, I, I was also at the boys' model, as you know. Um, seems to be getting a lot of uh, visits these days. Um, and there's a lot of learning that we can take from the, the work that is done in that school. Not just in that school, there are other schools which also exemplify a uh, very, very strong uh, uh, practice. Um, and I think there's, there's a, a number of ways in which, certainly from the, the departmental perspective, we encourage cooperation and collaboration. The first point is that it's a key element uh, within our sustainable schools policy that the school is well-rooted in the community. That is one of the key criteria in looking at whether a school is sustainable or not. It's also a fundamental part of the Every School a Good School policy, that there's very close connections between uh, the school and parents, and also the school and the community, and indeed other schools, uh, in order to support uh, peer learning. We also have, as part of our school improvement policy, uh, the creation of area learning communities, which provide the opportunity for schools to come together to share best practice, to um, talk about the issues that they face, uh, and to cooperate and collaborate on, on a, a um, consistent basis for the benefit of their pupils. So there's a range of ways there in, in, in our policies in which we, we support that. And certainly when the uh, inspectorate go out to visit schools and they're looking at school development plans, part of what they will be looking at is those very aspects of connections with the community, connections with other schools, how teachers uh, learn and develop, how they interact with their peers and how they improve the, the offer that they have for their children uh, and young people. Is there anything you want to add to that? 
Um, Chair, just to say then, on an operational delivery level, if you like, um, our school development service work very closely with all our school leaders um, around school development planning, um, around school improvement and around any of the strategies um, that we want to take forward as the Education Authority. We also have an Education Authority school leaders um, engagement group that has over 90 school leaders on it, where we actually try to co-design and build those strategies um, and outworkings with our school leaders so that we can ensure that what we're doing has a, is grounded in some of the practical realities, if you like, for schools and being able to deliver those. And how often does that meet? Um, we've just kicked it off, Chair, um, and it will continue to meet now on a quarterly basis. Okay. You just had one meeting, have you? Yeah. Okay. We have had previous forums in the past, and we do have our locality leadership team meetings, which are currently taking place over the course of the last few weeks as well. But really, the focus of that um, is around that co-design um, and really trying to harness and develop that co-design um, of what we do with our school leaders. Uh -huh. In, t in so long in terms of your opening remarks, you said that we, you know there's more that we can do collectively, uh, and I think all of us would share that view. I, I would say, as chair of this committee and as a former member of the Education Committee, um, we have taken the view in terms of uh, our um, inquiry so far that this cannot be something which can be addressed by the Department of Education working with the Education Authority on its own, uh, but it needs to be something which very much cuts across government. Otherwise, the, the, the report... First, our report will be another report that will sit on a, on a, on a shelf that is bowing with, with reports uh, and there are no improvement to the young people's lives and their educations. So, in terms of uh, having met with, um, albeit sadly remotely, Mr. Or Dr. Purdy and his team, and knowing some of his team, uh, including Mary Montgomery, the principal uh, of the boys' model, um, how can we ensure that that joined upness is there, which is very much needed to maximise the spend across government um, to, to improve education, drive up educational attainment, but actually mean that the school experience is something which is much more holistic and, and produces the, the, the young people that we'd all want to see coming out at the end of their school life? Well, I think there's a number of levels, Chair, at which uh, we need to address that problem. I think at the highest level, it's important that uh, education um, and the whole issue of attainment and indeed under underachievement and the differences in attainment between groups is a key uh, element within the programme for government uh, to which the executive uh, signs up. It's also important then within that um, in seeking to deliver the outcome in the programme for government, which is every child has the best start in life, that the various departments that can make a contribution to that are engaged under that outcome uh, as they are uh, and, and identifying how they can contribute to the achievement of that outcome. We work very closely, and I know Sarah works very closely as well with a whole range of bodies. We work very closely with a range of departments. For example, in terms of early years and sure start and special educational needs, we work hand in glove with the Department of Health uh, and with the Health and Social Care Board. We have very close connections with the, with the Department of Justice, also the Department for Communities in terms of the impact of the, the, the connections you were talking about earlier on between the school and the community. Uh, and also the Department for the Economy um, on, a, on, a, on a very wide range of fronts, but particularly in the 14 to 19 uh, 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 sphere. And of course, it's important that we identify what the connections are between all the strategies that sit below the programme for government. So we have, the, for example, the 10x economy, uh, which is the Department for the Economy's um, um, strategy. And in that, they have identified a number of priority areas which really require connections to be made with what is happening in schools and carried through into, into further education colleges, higher education colleges, and so forth on into the economy. So we work with uh, the Department for the Economy on that and identifying how we can make, best make those connections. I think a final example would be uh, in terms of the first start. The first start set out quite clearly the importance of collaborative working. Um, and in terms of the community, set out very clearly the importance of the Reducing Educational Disadvantage Programme and the role of the community in that. And we have started some work on what that would look like and how we could identify best practice there in order to take that forward. But also within that report, there is the commitment, uh, which was endorsed by the uh, executive. That report was endorsed by the executive. But there's a commitment from the First Minister and Deputy First Minister to receive a report on that twice a year, which will report on the progress that is being made. And I think that keeps this uh, whole programme very firmly on the agenda of the executive.
So you anything you want to answer? No, uh, other than to say I think it's important, um, Chair, that while we do collaborate and cooperate at a system level, it's, it's vital, it's more than important, um, I think if we look at some of the examples of good practice as well on the ground, um, some of which you've referred to, you can, you can see okay. that on, on the ground level it's really important that practitioners are working together um, and that we um, find a way to ensure that that can happen as a matter of routine and that we remove any barriers that are in place to do that because I think we have to do it from the ground up as well as the system okay. level down. I'm encouraged by both those answers. Um, so therefore, can I ask then, what type of collaborative approach uh, will you both take to drive through the recommendations of the report? Well, we, we um, have already in uh, identifying the actions that need to be taken forward, started to consider what the various contributions need to be from the various range of uh, departments. Um, and including the ones that I mentioned, uh, there are important implications here for the Department of Health, DFC and, and DFE, uh, and certainly in respect of First Start, uh, which is a key strategy that we want to take forward. We've established a programme board, um, which is represented from all of those various departments uh, on it, uh, each of which has, has actions identified against them and are preparing plans as to how they can take those actions forward. Um, that's the high-level approach that we're taking to, to, to that, and that will be managed uh, and, and directed by a senior responsible officer in the Department of Education. So that will help to make, ensure that all departments are contributing. Mm. Uh, how how are argument. you, though, as accounting officer and permanent secretary, going to make sure that the joint upness we've talked about um, actually happens? Because um, we have had permanent secretaries front of this committee who have been frustrated at the lack of collaboration, cooperation, communication. Uh, between departments here in terms of joined up governance in Northern Ireland. Uh, so how can, uh, and we, these, are, these are questions that we'll also put to the head of the civil service, the new head of the civil service who will be in front of this committee uh, later this month. Are you, can you assure us that, that that structure is in place to allow the joined upness that across government departments that is so needed to make sure First Start actually delivers for young people is there? Well, uh, I think to make the general point, it's, a, it's, it's always a work in progress making sure that across various boundaries people are working together, no matter whether it's across departments or any other organisation. So it's always a work in progress. It's something that everyone has to work uh, collectively on. It's, it's a combination, I think, of a, of a number of things. First is making sure that the appropriate structures are there and there's clarity over, over roles and responsibilities. And the programme board that I mentioned in respect of First Start has clear responsibilities set out and each department allocated uh, a particular action to take forward or that they're contributing to a particular action, those reports come back to the SRO there and, and, and on then uh, to me. But I think there's something more important than that. We can set up the structures, but in order to make them work, we need to work at collaborative relationships and positive mm. relationships. And that's at the heart of the Programme for Government and the outcome-based approach. And it's that outcome-based approach that we are applying to First Start we're not interested simply in how much money we're going to spend on this, assuming, of course, and I might come back to this later, we get the budget uh, to take everything forward. What we're interested in is what difference that funding has made and those activities have made and how we know it has, it has made a difference. So it's, it's in that way that we will be driving collaboration, uh, setting very, very clear metrics about what we expect to see and receiving reports back as to whether those are being achieved or not and where they aren't. Uh, identifying where we see the potential barriers or blockages or, or indeed just where, where there needs to be more discussions about how best to take something forward. Uh, and I think it's in that way and that oversight that we help to promote and mm. ensure that, that the cooperation and collaboration is happening. You may be aware that this committee produced an inquiry uh, a report in terms of the capacity and capability of the civil service and we made a number of recommendations. Some of those recommendations would go a long way to help uh, and d deliver the joined upness that we think is needed not just on this issue, but across government in Northern Ireland to, to achieve economies of scale and efficiency and effectiveness in terms of government. Sir, can I ask, sir, in terms of uh, what role does the Education Authority play in ensuring schools account for the use of the funds that are, that are given to them to provide the, um, improve the, um, the performance of children, particularly from de deprived backgrounds, to ensure the value of money, value for money is being obtained in relation to that funding. 
Okay, um, Chair, well, there, there are a range um, of funding mechanisms, as you'll know. There are those that are allocated to schools through the um, Common um, Funding Scheme, um, and the accountability for the Common Funding Scheme, uh, as you know, rests with Boards of Governors. However, our LMS teams, our local management of schools finance teams, work closely with schools on an ongoing basis on the production of their schools financial plans. Um, and then on any interventions, requirements or um, advice and support that schools may need um, on those schools' financial plans. So that is done um, at a more, um, uh, more global level, if you like, um, on the basis of the schools' um, financial plans. There are also then a number of earmarked funds um, that the department fund both the EA and some of which, which are devolved to schools. Um, and monitoring against the earmarked funds from the EA to DE has a very clear line of accountability around those objectives and what we do. It is more difficult to track the earmark funding. So, for example, um, in terms of, of, of uh, some of the um, programmes, against one specific programme um, of, of intervention. And really that's because, and we, we, we know that from some of the examples of the good practice, um, where schools want to apply some innovation or be able to, um, if you like, bring funds together. So, for example, we know that, for, that schools will quite often employ teachers um, with this, but they'll employ one whole time equivalent teacher using potentially three separate pots of money rather than three, not point three, whole time equivalent teachers, which makes sense and allows the schools that flexibility um, and innovation. So we do monitor school spend, we monitor it closely, we do work with schools around school spend um, and we do have the schools financial plans and our LMS teams work closely with the schools in that. But there is varying degrees of, if you like, um, uh, line by line, um, if you like, monitoring of that funding. Um, and part of that is also because of the administration that would be associated with that line by line monitoring of that funding, um, both at a school level um, and then what would be required at an EA level. Okay. So, not going to comment on other schools, and I'm sure other schools, as, as has been said uh, earlier, are, are equally as well managed and led uh, as Boys Model, but I can just finally make this point. In terms of Boys Model, what what did they do, working with yourselves, that allowed the money that they get, the TSN money that they get, to make such an impactful change on the school life of those young people, to deliver the results that they're getting, but also to improve the, the school life and experience for those young people in North Belfast that perhaps some other schools haven't? But what, what separates them out from other schools that, that haven't delivered like that? Well, I think what I think leadership and management of the school is a key point in that, um, Chair. And I know you've said there are other. Uh, that's not to make a commentary on, on other yeah. schools, but I do believe that strong leadership and management at school level is absolutely fundamental to this. I think it is also part of that working collaboratively with the community, um, and being able to feel empowered to take um, some of the decisions that they've taken and to use their funding. Um, to meet the needs of their school in the best way that meets their school. I'm, I'm not sure if maybe Patricia or Michelle might want to come in and say something okay. at that point, but I absolutely feel it, it is about innovation, it's about leadership and management, it's about maximising those opportunities, and it, it is about joining together the totality of the resource of the school to maximum benefit. Patricia, Michelle, would you like to add anything to what the Chief Executive has just said? Yeah, and I'm going to pick up on a point that somebody made a little bit earlier, one of the members, about collaboration. And I think that's what's working exceptionally well for the boys' model and other schools. And we know we're not comparing here. But what really works well for the model school and what we want to really take a look at closer is how they have engaged their parents in the learning. They've engaged their parents very early in careers development, careers advice, raising aspirations of the parents so that then that actually comes into the aspirations of their children. They have very, very um, well-cited um, provision for parents to come in and to engage in space and time to learn a little bit more about what the school is doing, to learn a little bit more about what the children are doing. So it's a very contextualised programme for the children that are coming into their area. They're also really, really well aware 
of the social and the non-academic needs of the children so they know when it's time to take the foot off the pedal they know if a child is late that there may be a reason but they don't slip their standards they, they, they have a conversation offline with that child so we, we're talking about all of the pioneering models that we're observing in the boys model and other schools where they're linking really closely with their parents really closely with their communities and they're investing in the young person so that when the young person is getting programs in the morning and programs in the afternoon it's not additional teaching really it's a warm meal in their tummy it's making sure that the teacher shows them that they're valuing them enough to give them their time after school and all of that allows the boys to begin to believe in themselves so it's a very very heavily layered and tiered program to make the boys believe in themselves but what we really want to do as an authority is to take all of these pioneering projects across Northern Ireland and to pull out some of the, the learning that we can contextualise across other schools through our school improvement professional partners. And we have assigned a school improvement professional partner to every school to gather intelligence, to really get in to see where is the effect of practice, because there's effect of practice in every school. And sometimes when you link into a school that maybe isn't performing as well in terms of outcomes, mm -hmm and you come to look at best practice, you come to look at good practice, you elevate their aspirations and you elevate their outcomes. And that's the school improvement model that we are really, really driving forward at the moment. That co-design with schools, that really learning from schools that are doing things really well and trying to disseminate that across all of the other schools in Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr Muir. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you everyone for coming back to the Public Accounts Committee this afternoon. It's appreciated, and I also I appreciate um, how this is a cross-cutting issue that stretches beyond um, the Department of Education and the Education Authority and requires an entire response from government and society, so I fully uh, appreciate that. J just two questions. One, um, well, both of them relate from the, the visit to uh, Boys Middle School, which I find um, extremely valuable and very much appreciative of them accommodating ourselves and, as has been noted, others. Um, one thing is that um, the, there's been increased provision uh, of what you would describe as counselling services and different support services around their arena of mental health, um, and funding is being used to provide that, whether it's through TSN or other funding streams. Strictly speaking, the argument would be that that is a, a, a health function, and it's where you'd be on having an, an understanding of what engagement there is with the Department of Health and with Public Health Agency to try to ensure that um, there's collaborative funding and arrangements in place to ensure that those services can be accessed, because it's important that they're accessed easily and without any stigma, and generally that is within the educational environment. So it's really one more is from Department of Education, Education Authority doing to engage with the Department of Health and Public A Health Agency to ensure that there's a collaborative approach in relation to this and that the TSN funding is targeted towards what it's meant to address. Well, if I can respond in the, in the, in the first instance, Mr. Muir, to your question about, about, about mental health issues and about yeah. counselling services. And uh, th this has been uh, a real issue. Uh, not just recently uh, because of COVID, but it has been certainly exacerbated because of the, the impact of COVID on our children and young people. Uh, and working with the Department of Health, we have developed an emotional health and, and well-being framework. Uh, and we have provided funding, co-funding with the department uh, to try and provide that support into schools. There's some 5 million recurrent funding has been made available by our department uh, in education and an additional 1.5 million has come from the Department of Health because they also obviously see this <clears throat> as a priority. There are other aspects that maybe aren't labelled as, as counselling or therapy uh, or therapeutic services, which are also important. For example, the nurture provision that's available in schools, which assists children with any difficulties that they might have. And there's a, on a recurrent basis, there's some 4 million going into that uh, nurture provision. In addition, uh, the Minister has, has launched the, uh, the Healthy Happy Minds uh, pilot uh, this year, um, which will operate until the end of the year, and after that we'll be looking at the learning out of that. And that goes beyond, it includes counselling for primary school pupils, but it goes beyond that to include other sort of therapeutic services, whether it's art therapy and activities, music therapy and activities, dance and drama, and all those other aspects which are important in the development of children and young people in an important way for them to express themselves and to 
express their feelings when maybe sometimes they, they lack the words, and that can provide the um, means for uh, the, that support that they need to be provided. I think the other aspect of our engagement with health would be on the special educational needs side, and Sarah may want to get into that, but uh, obviously there's health professionals involved, uh, and there's close cooperation with health, health in providing the support that children with special educational needs require. And most obviously in the early years, in Sure Start, where health professionals are involved right from the outset and fully in the delivery of those services, working alongside um, the other workers in, in, in that area to identify early the issues that children are having uh, and trying to ensure that appropriate support is given to prevent those from developing into more serious issues. So those would be some of the examples that I would, I, I would point to. I don't know if Sarah, if there's anything else you want to add. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, maybe just to say that I think that um, throughout the pandemic and also um, with our work on special educational needs, our, our on-the-ground relationships again with health have really improved and we are working very closely with our colleagues at the Health and Social Care Board, at the PHA um, and at the practitioner level, at trust level, um, working to maximise uh, what we can deliver um, through cooperation. We still have a way to go, there's no doubt about that in terms of um, counselling at school level versus counselling at trust level versus counselling by community and voluntary groups and if we were to join all those up, what might that look like? Um, and we're, I think we all would acknowledge that, but I think what we can say with confidence is that the mental health and young people, that the mental health of our children and young people um, has, the support for them has developed and has been enhanced really. Um, over the course of the pandemic and we need to take that good work and really now build on it. And, and I think as, as the Permanent Secretary said, a lot of that comes down to those relationships. So it's important that we build on those positive relationships that we are developing. I think, I think there was a second question, which I can't quite remember. It was about TSN funding. Uh, well, yeah, I'll, I'll probably relate back in terms of supplementary around this. And I entirely agree with Sarah. I think the pandemic has been really, really challenging and, and devastating for families across Northern Ireland, but it's also improved working relations between departments and agencies, um, and I think that um, needs to be built upon. But one of the issues is just around the funding for these, um, particularly for uh, counselling services. I know that sometimes that is to get the funding for those services can be extremely difficult and that schools have to explore all different avenues to try to get funding for it. And it's just you know, obviously TSN and other different funding streams are being used for that. And it's just, is there much more of a understanding about getting a, a, a steady funding stream so we can provide these services within schools without the schools having to struggle to, to, to get the money together to provide them, you know? So the, the uh, counselling service um, for post-primary schools is a universal service and it's open to all primary aged pupils age 11 to 19. So it is the, um, it is the uh, Healthy Happy Minds that is, is being piloted and that's around primary school counselling provision. But as the Permanent Secretary said, it's also much more. And I think part of the reason why that is in the pilot phase is that we're really testing that. There are differing views on counselling for primary school children um, with nurture being the preferred um, method for, for younger children. But we all have to accept where we are in terms of the impact, particularly the pandemic has had on our children's uh, mental health. And so I think it's given us a good opportunity to test that in terms of expansion. And yeah. um, Permanent Secretary may want to comment. Well, I, I think Sarah's point is really important. Uh, the, the key aspect is that whatever support is provided is age appropriate. Uh, and in some cases, counselling may not be appropriate for very young children. It would be other aspects of support that they need. In some cases, it may be. So we're not taking a blanket approach to this. That's why the Healthy Happy Minds, the, the whole approach was broadened out so that it can take account of the full range of children's needs and how they might present and what the best way of supporting them is. And part of the idea of the pilot will be to assess those and then decide how best we can take that forward uh, if the funding is available to allow us to do that. Just one more question. Quite a lot uh, today we're talking about sharing of good practice. So one of the examples I saw of good practice, um, a boys model where is in advance of the um, young men starting at year eight, there would be a visit to each of the family homes to understand a bit more about the family, about the young person, uh, around the circumstances that they're in, 
and also to allay any fears in terms of commencement of um, life at Boys Model. And I find that was an extremely valuable thing that was being undertaken because it ensures that the school has a full 360 degrees understanding of how things are in relation to the, um, the, the home and any support that would need to be provided for that and any challenges the young person may have in terms of their education going forward. The issue for me is that that is a really valuable initiative. Um, and what has been done to share initiatives like that and encourage other schools to undertake that? Uh, because to me, that was you know a shining example whereby if the young person, when they arrive on their first day at the beginning of the academic term, um, that they, the school has a good understanding of the person and also the young person's any fears are allayed. Well, uh, you make a very important point, Mr. Muir, uh, on, on that whole, whole issue. Uh, we know that any transitions within the education sector are difficult for, for young people uh, and have to be managed very carefully. <clears throat> um, and the work that the boys model do is replicated across a whole range of schools. Uh, and one of the features certainly that I have found when I visit schools, but particularly those that are dealing with children from disadvantaged circumstances, is just how well they know their children. They, they know the children, they know the background, and they make it their business to know the background so that they understand when a, children, when a child is behaving in a certain way in the school, what the underlying factors might be and how best they might address that. And that, and that, that homeschool liaison and that contact is really, really uh, important. It's a feature of the boys' model. It's also a feature of, 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 of many schools right across uh, Northern Ireland. In terms of uh, sharing best practice, we share best practice in a whole range of ways. One a recent example I could point to would be the uh, series of studies that were undertaken called the, the STAR case studies, um, which were undertaken by the department and then were published more widely. And I'm just looking down through those, and one of those actually uh, referred to cross-phase links uh, in order to support transition uh, and to identify, apply, and share best practice. And it related to some work that's being done in Hazelwood College in Belfast and developing links with feeder primary schools for literacy and numeracy and having visits with the staff across the, the schools to help the children to be familiarised uh, and indeed the teachers observing each other, which is, I find it's quite unusual, teachers observing each other in terms of pedagogy uh, as to how they're actually teaching uh, and, and, and that that had a real impact then on helping the children to settle in. So that's one example of how, of how that would be done. Certainly where we uh, identify best practice, we disseminate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hillage. Thanks, Chair, and folks, you're very welcome this afternoon. Um, just just a quick question on the funding there. It's been fairly well covered, but in 2019-20, the 76 million of TSI, TSN money was uh, given to schools. What, what sort of percentage of the schools you know actually use that for a sort of general top-up of their budget? <coughs> Well, the, the key point about targeting social need is that it's part of the common funding formula. Uh, and the common funding formula and the budget that's made available to schools is, is unhypothecated, which means it doesn't have to be used for specific purposes. Although there are elements within the formula that help to make up the overall amount a school gets, the school is not bound to actually spend the money precisely on those factors. It's a way of identifying all the factors that raise the costs that a school will face and making sure that, that the budget is adequate. But as I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, our view on our view of, of well, the common funding formula is based on delegation to schools. It's based on the premise that schools are best placed to make the decisions in light of their own circumstances as to how to deploy their resources, including their funding and their teachers, and how best to organise themselves to ensure that they get the best outcomes for the children who are there. TSN is is the same. So schools will use that and will use TSN funding for a range of purposes. Uh, some of those will be directed specifically towards children uh, who are from socially disadvantaged circumstances. Some of them will be for broader whole school policies. And it, it, it can make sense to uh, take a whole school or a whole class approach rather than differentiating out in order to have an impact. For example, if we look at something like attendance at school, which is a critical area, that's a whole school policy. It's not something you apply to particular pupils. However, the impact that it has is more important for some pupils than it is for others, but it's a whole school approach. Likewise, there can be whole class approaches uh, can also be taken that will benefit some children more than others, but it's a whole class, don't differentiate. The other point uh, in terms of making sure that the funding um, 
it doesn't just go to children who are in free school meals, is that there are other kids who will present with significant difficulties. You might, might not be picked up by that indicator. Um, you, can have, you can have the working poor, uh, and you can have others who are presenting particularly difficulties, and it's important that they can benefit also from the funding that's made available. So the evidence that we have in terms of where the funding goes on TSN is that the bulk of it goes in teaching. Uh, and it goes in teaching in order to support teaching in smaller groups, which is where those who are having difficulties can benefit. It's not generally smaller classes throughout the whole school, but, but it's, it's, it's small group teaching. And we mentioned the boys' model, uh, and they have what they term, if I recollect, access classes, and they have what they term progression classes, where, and, then, and then they have what you might term the mainstream classes. And the children can progress through those various phases and get the support they need at that particular time in order to be able to um, um, improve and to be able to get to where their, their, their peers are. So that's the flexibility that schools have in using this, and we believe that they're best placed to make those kinds of decisions. And are there schools who just use it for a general top up? Well, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by general top up. They will use it for whatever they see as being the pressures that they face. Well, it seems to be like a very wide range in there as to what the usage of those funds are put to. Well, all, all the evidence that we have uh, from the returns we've had to date, and we have got more recently, there has, there has been an issue about getting the returns in TSN for, for a number of years, but now with our, uh, com our online system, we have over 700 returns. Uh, this year uh, from schools as to how they're spending their TSM money and we'll be able to analyse it. But all the evidence that, to date... Is that a big improvement from previous years? Uh, beforehand, there, uh, uh, there had been a problem with actually short of strike and schools not cooperating and so stuff hadn't been coming back. Uh, so that is a very big improvement. But in terms of where the money goes, the evidence from the, the last figures we had, in, I think it was 2011, was that 41% of TSM money goes in the smaller classes I just referred to, the smaller te teaching groups. Around 38% goes in specialist support for learning needs. There's 7% on pastoral care, homeschool liaison, all those things we've been talking about in terms of liaison with the community and with parents. 2% um, in staff development, 7% in curriculum materials, and 5% in other. So there's no evidence there that there's a general you know, use, use of TSM funds for things that aren't appropriate. The other point I would say is that this is all <clears throat> set out in the school development plan, uh, and the school has to identify its priorities, how it's using all its funding, and specifically how it's using its TSN funding. And that is there, and it's available for the EA to look at, it's available for CCMS to look at, and it's available for the inspector to look at, to make sure that the money's being used appropriately <coughs> to meet the key issues that are uh, present in the school. Okay, thank you. Uh, you did mention the free school meal situation there, and their concerns were raised. Uh, if that was the best way to, to draw these matters out, uh, what would the department be doing to ensure that the data required demonstrates the effectiveness of the fund and provided to raise the attainment of pupils for free school meals? And is it the best way to identify the issues? You did mention there, even in the previous remarks, sir, what I would have deemed people slipping through the process as such. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the debate on this has been going for 20, 30 years uh, as to what the best indicator is. There's no perfect indicator for identifying all those who would, who would come either from socially disadvantaged circumstances or would have other issues that would need support in, in the school. The reason free school meals is used is because it's readily available, it's specific to the pupil. It doesn't relate to an area, because some kids in the area may not go to the local school. It relates to the pupils who are actually in the school, and it's updated every year. Uh, so those are the key characteristics. The other point is... But there has been research done and to, to um, measure the association between free school meals and whether or not it's a, it's a good reflection of deprivation and also how it's associated with lower attainment. Uh, and study after study has demonstrated that free school meals is a very, very strong indicator and is widely used and accepted. In terms of how the TSN money is used and is it being effective, um, over, over the period in, in, in question, the, the progress of Young people uh, who are on entitled to free, free school meals, you're achieving five plus GCSEs that they start to see increased from 26% up to 50%. That's a very significant increase. It was a greater increase than was achieved for those people who are not on free school meals, and it led to some narrowing of the gap between the two. So real uh, absolute levels of achievement uh, and attainment increased significantly, and there was some closing of the gap. 
The issue is, and we could spend a long time talking about this, the, the whole impact of social deprivation on attainment is a worldwide phenomenon. It's one that no system has completely cracked, and it's one that every system works at. Um, the evidence that we have from international studies suggests actually that here it's less of a factor than it is in other countries across the, uh, the OECD. And I would put that down in part to the, uh, the, the policies of the department in that area. There was some mention of pursuing alternatives as a measure as well. Any indication of what those would Yeah, I think there's consideration in the, in the department as, uh, to, to have a review as to whether free school still remains the best measure. There's also the point that, that it, it really depends on, on the policy that's being delivered. Uh, there could be other policies where actually it makes more sense to take an area-based approach and to, to uh, use the, uh, the measures of deprivation that come from the census. Uh, it's something that we would look at in light of the policy. What are we trying to achieve? Uh, how do we deliver the programme? And what therefore gives us the best measure? In some cases, maybe other places measure. potentially on an international level to look at alternatives. Sorry, I missed a start. Do you look at other places on an international level even to see what alternatives are? Yes, we do. We do look, and, and, and that's the point I was making earlier, earlier, earlier on. If you look further within the UK, fee school measures are widely used, as are some of the place-based measures that I, that I mentioned that come from the census, and that would that would be fairly common uh, across other countries. Uh, accountability and assessments there. At the last evidence session, the committee was not convinced that there was enough data evidence to inform policy making in closing the gap in educational attainment. Is that a fair assessment? I think what, what is true to say is that there have been there has been difficulty over the past number of years as a consequence of industrial action in being able to harness the the information that had been coming through uh, pre previously in terms of information from schools. Um, however, the sources of information that we have available to us in terms of how effective our policies are relate to, for example, the international surveys I mentioned, which are conducted here in Northern Ireland at primary school level and post-primary level. So we have the PEARLS, uh, uh, which looks at reading. We have the TIMS, which looks at um, maths and science. We have in the post-primary, we have the PISA, uh, which, which looks at student attainment for those who are age 15. And on all those measures, particularly at the primary le level, Northern Ireland is above the OECD average, and in fact, our young people are performing at the upper end in terms of the OECD. At post-primary, we're at or just slightly above the, uh, the OECD average. So those broader measures and comparators, and the, the same instruments are used in every country to make sure that, the, that you, we're making a fair comparison, indicate that good progress is, is being made and standards here are comparable with elsewhere. But of course, we're always looking to try and do better than that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mr McHugh. Uh, good afternoon, Chair. Thank you, Chair. I guess uh, Fatih Rovalek, you're all very welcome uh, to the meeting today. Uh, it's very interesting, just uh, comments to date, and much of it ha have, have covered the areas that I intended to raise questions on. But if I go right back again to, to uh, what appears to be, we'll say at the present time anyway, um, progress in terms of identifying need and, and ensuring delivery, uh, that when it actually comes to sort of targeting social need and uh, that the poor response that we would have had, we'll say from schools in the first instance, uh, and uh, respond to the planner. Um, can you explain why that was the case, that so many schools didn't feed into that? Yes, well, there, there, there was a change in the system. O originally, when targeting social need funding was given out, it was given out, obviously, as part of the, the, um, the common funding formula. Uh, and there was a particular uh, return within the common funding formula that asked for a financial return, indicating how schools used their funding in that. That continued up to 2010 uh, or 20, 20, 20, 2011, and that indicated the sort of things I, was, I mentioned to Mr Hilditch as to what the money was spent on the smaller classes, the specialist support and so forth, and there were very good returns at that point. The decision was then taken uh, when new regulations came in about school development planning uh, and also the Every School of Good School policy came in, that it was important that how schools were using the funding was included as part of their, their, their plan. Uh, and therefore, a part of the plan should be returned. With, there should be an annex there setting out exactly how they were spending the TSN funding. So I think in the first instance, that change in itself created a little bit of disruption. Then we got into the whole uh, area of 
uh, the, the difficulty in industrial relations and the action sort of strike, and schools were not making the returns. And the last returns that we, that we got were really there were about 6% of schools that made the returns. Now, I would say that the 6% of schools, when we, when we analysed that expenditure, it showed the same pattern as we had, we had, we had seen in the period from 2005, 6 to 2010, 11. So there was nothing in that that suggested there was a significant change in the way schools were spending their money. And I'm pleased to say that with the work that the department has done uh, through computerising the return, and the minister has, has written out to schools, encouraging them to make a return, uh, to date we, we have 731 schools have made that return, which is about 60% of those schools that, that would be making the return. So we're going to have a really good evidence base. And We'll be analysing that and we'll be able to see whether there's been any change in, in, in the pattern of how schools are using their funding. Uh, and just in addition to that, then, uh, in terms of um, making an adjustment, why not there is maybe a more efficient, targeted way to um, uh, ensure that these funds are spent in, in, the, in the correct way. Uh, are you adopting any approach in relation to that other 40% that haven't made returns? Or does that imply, once again, too, just as was been sort of alluded to, that when it comes to sort of receiving the funding in the first instance, because they don't have to, in another way, uh, account for it, and as much as that they describe to you how it is that they target it, um, uh, has that actually been taken up by the Education Authority with those schools? Well, uh, in, in the first instance, I, I would go back to the, the comments I made in my opening remarks as to what our school improvement policy is based on. Uh, and that is based on the view that it's the school and the Board of Governors that are responsible for the way they use resources, responsible for identifying the issues that, that exist in, in the school and the actions that need to be taken. We have highly qualified professional teachers and principals uh, and we have Boards of Governors who are assisted with information that the Department provides in terms of how similar schools and similar circumstances uh, are doing. And armed with that information, they are best placed as the professionals on the ground to make the decisions as to how the funding should actually be used. So that is why the funding is in the formula, but we don't say, we, we don't tell schools exactly how they should, should uh, use it, because every school will be different and will have, have the, their own circumstances they want to address. However, there are some other initiatives outside uh, the common funding formula where a view is taken, perhaps by the minister, usually by the minister, in fact always by the minister, uh, as to what, what he or she would wish to target. And that would be the earmarked funds that were referred to earlier on. And we've had some examples of that, for example, with um, programmes that are targeting specifically numeracy and literacy, and funds would be directed towards that particular issue, and there would be returns, monitoring returns made to make sure the money was spent on that. But those earmarked funds are for those very specific issues that the Minister would have identified. The, in the common funding formula, the money is made available to the school, for the school to decide to give them the flexibility. And the other point I would make on this is that what, what we found more recently through the Engage programme is that when we reviewed the Engage programme after its first year, one of the key things we did on the basis of feedback from schools was to give schools more flexibility in how they used the funding. Because the reality was if the department from a distance is trying to determine or predetermine how funding should be spent, that's not going to work in every single circumstance. So the schools are best placed to make those decisions. Uh, and we've given that extra flexibility and the schools have, have welcomed that. Yeah, I can totally understand that schools can make the decisions for themselves. But at the same time, I'm sure there's a degree of accountability there that for the education authority should be pursued in those schools to say that don't make returns uh, currently. Well, schools do submit their financial plans to the education authority and certainly that is the mechanism through which um, their funds are, are, if you like, monitored um, and the discussions are had with schools. Um, in relation to earmarked funding, Again, I would say the um, administration that is associated with earmark funding, both at a school level and an education authority level, can be significant. Um, and it's always about getting the balance right between making sure we have right and appropriate accountability and not overburdening schools with administrative returns. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Beggs. <coughs> Just to highlight, I'm, I'm a governor of a, a sure start, uh, Horizon Sure Start, uh, and in terms of that, uh, I'm aware of, of copious amount of data being recorded. So my questioning around that: How is that data being used to give feedback and learning? 
Yes, well, I, I, I make a few comments, and I think I'll invite Linda, uh, who's who's somewhere on the star leaf, to come in on that because she is the, the person who leads on Sure Start. Uh, one of, one of the earlier commentaries that was made um, by the audit office uh, or, by, or by one of our reviews, and it's referenced in the in the report, uh, was that there wasn't sufficient. Uh, evidence that was setting out clearly what the outcomes that were being achieved in Sure Start actually were. So there's been a significant uh, amount of work that's been undertaken over the, over the past uh, four or five years to uh, identify clear instruments which can identify the progress that has been made in children's uh, uh, development and learning uh, and, and to uh, quantify and measure that and then in doing that to identify what the good practice is and to disseminate that. Uh, and in, in the, the uh, audit office report, it does talk about some of those. So it talks about the 74% um, the of children who attended a developmental program uh, for two to three year olds uh, who were tracked using the Welcome Early Years Toolkit, which is one of these instruments, uh, and the progress that they made. There's also the Outcomes Star Toolkit, which has a range of elements to it, which are, which are measured, and that indicated that child development had improved for 60% of families attending a Sure Start. So these are instruments which have been tried and tested, which are applied within the Sure Starts and are used to track the, the progress of children. But if, um, if Linda is there, perhaps Linda would like to add some further comments. Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, can. Um, yes, as, as Dr. Brown says, there's been significant development um, in how we measure Sure Start outcomes. Um, and the, um, the tools that are used over time to, to make sure that we have the evidence that supports the development of children. Um, we have, there are five key policy outcomes of Sure Start, and what we do is we align all of the evidence that we collect to demonstrate how each of those five policy outcomes are, uh, are met. Um, and we continually work on that. that as Dr. Brown had said, Sure Start is very much a collaborative approach between the Department of uh, Education and the Health and Social Care Board within the Department of Health. Um, and we continually work with them to develop ways to make sure that the evidence that we are collecting from the Sure Start project is meaningful so that it, it is collected so that it can demonstrate that children have improved and that overall that improvement is uh, contributing towards achievement of the policy outcomes. My question is, what feedback has actually come back to the Sure Starts to point to them good practice or, for that matter, areas where they, they need to improve? Yes, yeah, so um, the evidence is collated then on a Sure Start project level. Um, the Sure Start programme is administered by the Health and Social Care Board. So at a project level, all of that, um, the, the achievement will be measured at a project level. And then there are individual managers within the Health and Social Care Board who will look at what has been achieved by projects. They will also be able to see what has been achieved overall across all of the projects. Uh, we have 38 sure, uh, sure Start projects, and they will be able to feed back to them then where they are doing really well, where there might be areas where they... Um, sure Start is very much um, about learning and developing from shared practice, and the Sure Start projects are excellent at this. They work closely together, to, and with, there are many events and, and engagements at which Sure Start projects will... Um, put forward areas where they have tried something and it's worked really well and share that with the other projects to see if that might be something that they could try in their area. And we also have um, the Education Training Inspectorate will lo looks at uh, Sure Start on an annual basis and they identify within that areas of really good practice. Um, each year they report to us and provide evidence of that really good practice and that is then shared uh, across all of the Sure Start projects and um, that allows for continual development of Sure Start. And we have, again, the Education Authority, or sorry, the ETI Education Training Inspector will um, follow up on what previous recommendations have been, seeing that there has been continual development in that and looking to see that it has been shared across all of the 38 Sure Start projects. I'm aware of, aware of learning uh, between Sure Start projects, but my question is specifically about from the copious amount of data that's being recorded, what learning is coming, and I'm not, not hearing it. Um, one area which I would ask that you would look at is, is the issue of, because I'm aware of how, how beneficial it is, 
the, the number of young people with speech and language issues that gets picked up very, very early through Sure Start, and therefore there should be a reduced number from Sure Start there that are first picked up at primary school. Now, that's an essential marker, otherwise, those young people are sitting at the back of their classrooms having difficulty to engage. I mean, my, my concerns about the data is, is we're not really getting feedback that's useful uh, or, or being encouraged to go in what I consider to be uh, significant directions from the data. There's good sharing between Sure Start programmes. Um, can I just so make a, leave that uh, with you as a thought to look at the issue of speech and language getting yeah. picked up earlier. But otherwise, parents frequently would not have been able to uh, get through the various hurdles to go through the conventional uh, health trust route. Yeah. Could, could I just make a quick comment on that, Mr Beggs? Um, first of all, I, I wouldn't accept the data is not being used. I think the data is being used and there is communication between the professionals that are involved in Sure Start as to what works and that that is disseminated. But the other point you made about uh, speech and language services I think is, is, is a really important one. And <clears throat> when I went out to visit uh, Glenbrook Nursery uh, up in North Belfast and met with Caroline Milligan up there, she talked to me about, about the, the approach that they took, and she mentioned specifically her approach of what she called targeted universalism, which seems a bit of an oxymoron, but it goes to the heart of the point that you are making, because the approach that Sure Start makes is to ensure that it is open to all the parents and children in the area. It doesn't target right from the outset. It's open to all. It encourages the parents to come in, many of whom maybe are a bit reluctant or a bit unsure, don't like to go outside their area or their immediate neighbourhood, uh, are not sure how they're going to engage with professionals. They're encouraged in with the things like the Play and Stay programme, and it's in the course of, 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 of that then that those professionals that are there can identify the other needs that the children have, which would include the speech and language, and haven't built the trust with the parents when they come in, they can then signpost them and encourage them to the other services. And I'm sure you will experience this in the, in the, in the sheer start that you're involved with. So that's a really, really important aspect of it. I agree entirely with that. T t turning to TSN um, uh, and the expenditure, during our, our visit to uh, Boys Model, we were given very clear direction how a range of funding was being targeted to appropriate areas as it was intended. Uh, and in terms of TSN, additional maths and English teachers, youth workers, uh, well-being period just, just being being an example. Uh, it's a very, very good use uh, of TSN uh, to, to benefit uh, the, those children. Uh, so how do you, how are you sure that money is always targeted towards uh, uh, the particular group that it was rather than just going into the, the school <coughs> plot? <coughs> Well, I think that, 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 that goes to the point I was making uh, earlier, Mr Begg, which is that <clears throat> the um, schools have delegated budgets. There's a formula that makes up the various elements of that. It includes TSN for those children who are, from, who are either achieving a low le level or, and or are from socially disadvantaged backgrounds, uh, and that money is made available to the school, working with the, uh, the principal, working with the Board of Governors, through the school development planning process, and supported by the information which we provide about other schools in similar circumstances and the attainment of their pupils and so forth, for them to identify the issues that there are in the school and then to allocate the resources to that. So this money is not hypothecated towards the individual uh, free school male entitled children. It is there to take account of the issues that they and other children will present. And I mentioned earlier on that, that any indicator is not perfect. Uh, and that there will be other children who have similar type, type of difficulties and similar type of disadvantaged circumstances who wouldn't be picked up by fee school maids and that we would want to ensure could benefit from that uh, funding. And that's an approach that's taken not just here, and that's an approach that's taken over in, in England and the premium that they provide to uh, support schools. And they recognise that whole class approaches and whole school approaches are also important in benefiting all children, but particularly those that present with particular circumstances. But in terms of, of, of checking, is it being used well? That will be set out in school development plan. That is available whenever the inspectorate uh, come to inspect the school. The district inspectors will be in on a regular basis uh, into schools, and they will be aware of how the schools are, are, are spending their, their funding. So we, we, we do have a, a good handle on how schools are, are using the funding and whether it's being used effectively. You indicate that it's primarily the responsibility of the school, the, the, uh, the senior staff and, and the governors to decide how it's spent uh, and to maximise the use of TSN funding. Of course, to, to maximise the opportunities in education, it's important that the children and the teachers 
are all in school. Uh, so I, I'm just curious, how do you feed back to schools and how do you uh, encourage the use of TSN funding when there are some wards where up to 35% of year 8 to, to year 12s who have less than 85% in tenants at school? Do you ensure that some of that money uh, is targeted to, make, to, to assisting those young people return to school and provide this extra uh, outside school activity, which clearly is working in the likes of boys' model school. Yeah, well, uh, I'll make a few comments, and there may be others who will wish to come in. Um, I mean, school attendance is one of those whole school policies I was referring to that will have a particular impact on children in disadvantaged circumstances and other difficult circumstances. Um, but which is applied across the, the entire school. It will be, it's a key indicator for uh, any school and it's something that we would expect to see reflected in the school development plan, something that we expect the principals and the boards of governors to pay attention to. Uh, we've talked before about visits to schools and I mentioned at the last meeting about the, the, um, the visit I had to Holy, Holy Cross Boys School and they talked there about going out to uh, the, the homes of pupils, knocking on the doors and making sure that the children come into school. But there is something here uh, that's really important about the relationships that the schools build with parents so that they can encourage parents to see the value of education and the importance of not missing any days at school, uh, if possible. And that goes to the heart of what we talked about earlier on, the connections between schools and parents uh, and schools and the community. And the TSN funding, uh, uh, some schools will use that to support pastoral care, which picks up on the sort of issues that many of these young children are, 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 are facing. In many cases, there can be very, very complicated, I'm sure you're only too aware, very complicated reasons why a child might not come into school. And it's not just because the child themselves doesn't want to come to school. Uh, so that pastoral care and the support that's there can help to increase the understanding there and provide the support that's necessary and support the homeschool liaison that is required around that. I don't know if any of my colleagues or Sarah wants to say anything but more about that. I was going to potentially ask Patricia if she wanted to comment on some of the models of good practice um, uh, that some of the schools have used the TSN funding for in this area. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, I think also I'd like to start off by saying we are beginning to have conversations with all of our school principals through that SIP um, model. So the school improvement model that I referenced earlier, where each school has a school improvement professional partner, where they engage in conversations. And the model that we are looking at as we're, as we're driving forward, particularly so that we don't let anybody slip through the net, is to look at that support challenge and intervention. So it's nice to go and have a cup of coffee and learn what's going on in, in a school. But it's also great to go in with the information that you have. And you, you've just given me a piece of information that our SIPs use very, very often, the contextual school individual data. So the school's attendance, for example, as you've said, is at 85%. Within the school, to the school and going through the school development plan, and if there wasn't any type of mitigating strategies or actions within the school development plan to address, um, really that's quite a low level of attendance. Then all our concerns would be in and around why not. So we'd be having a harder kind of a conversation with the school around the targets that they're putting in place, the actions that they're putting in place, and how they're identifying all of the the needs of the children within their school. So I think it's very important to say that um, over the last year in particular, there have been quite a number of pots of funding that have gone into schools. Engage has been a particularly effective um, fund that has gone into schools and schools are using it exceptionally well to try and ensure that their children are in a, a better place emotionally to access learning and then to improve their literacy and numeracy. And in conversations the SIPs are having with their school leaders, they are talking about the TSN funding, they're talking about how they're going to use their um, healthy, healthy hands, healthy minds, how they're using the lack um, funding, how they're using the different pots, how they're merging the pots and being able to get, get as much as they possibly can from the funding, but ensure that they're meeting the objectives of the funding. So I think this is an area that we're moving more and more into through the challenge support and intervention model of the school improvement professionals are, are, are taking forward. Um, you'll all be aware during lockdown that we developed a really, I suppose, um, for us a very pioneering collaborative model with all of the other partner organisations. And that um, realised itself through a cross-organisational link officer. 
And the cross organisation link officer was a single officer that was attached to every school across Northern Ireland, but drawn from one of the three or four main um, partner bodies that were supporting schools. So the conversations at the um, start of the uh, lockdowns and the disrupted learning were really much focused on where they could get help for health, where they could help get help if there was attendance issues, where they could get help if there were other issues around remote learning. But that that um, role has evolved, and there are more and more conversations around, you know, how are you using your funds? How are you looking at um, uh, the learning and the impact on the learner? And all of these conversations come together to give us a really, really good angle and a really good intelligence base on how the schools are using their funding. So that is a model that we want to really drive forward. As we, if we come out of COVID, where the SIP is really, really having a conversation around, in the main, all of the identification of need and then how, the, how their schools are using all the different pots of money to really, really get targeted inter interventions in as early as possible. Yeah. I'd mentioned the importance of having both this, the school children and the teachers in school. Uh, and my area concerned uh, around that is I'm aware uh, of an issue of a senior teacher who has been out of school for two years now because of numerous spurious complaints. And so my question to Ms Long is, are you satisfied that when there is um, errors in leadership and further guidance needed by gov two governors, that the HR support and intervention is there from the Education Authority to ensure that large amounts of public funds are not wasted? Yes, our HR team do work closely with schools and with boards of governors, as well as Michelle and her team, where there are difficulties being encountered in a school, and um, where, where there are a wide range of difficulties being encountered by a school, we will work collaboratively, and we do have cross-directorate case management around any of our schools that are in difficulty that include input from our education directorate, input from our HR directorate, input from our children and young people's services directorate, as required. You accept that two years been out of school by a senior professional who has isn't very competent is unacceptable and a waste of money. It is not ideal and it is not a circumstance in which we would want to find ourselves and we do work closely, as I say, with schools, with individuals, with their trade unions in terms of trying to address those issues. And are you in particular responding to trade unions' concerns which has hit the high highlight uh, today? in terms of criticism of Ballyclare Secondary School? There's significant intervention on behalf of the Education Authority um, in Ballyclare. Um, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to discuss the individual or complex issues here today, but I am aware of them, and I know that Michelle and her team have spent a significant amount of time addressing them. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say Ballyclare and what, whatever isn't going on in Ballyclare is not a matter for this committee or this inquiry. So. Um, can I just ask some questions? Uh, um, sorry, I'll bring in Ms Hunter before I do that. Sorry, Ms Hunter. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I thank you, panel, for being here today. Um, Mr Beggs actually raised a, a number of questions that I had, and I welcome his point um, on the issues around speech and language. Um, I've just noted through my office uh, post-COVID, um, there's definitely been an increase uh, in young people and um, in those early years and some parents feel due to a lack of social socialization during COVID and that there's been a few issues. So we do welcome um, that that's been raised uh, previously. I uh, just really have one question. I mean, we talked about specific areas of improvement um, and addressing specific needs. And I was just wondering, um, is there any specific concerns or barriers noted um, with children in rural areas in educational achievement? And the re reason I asked, is I recently spoke with a rural principal who said oftentimes he feels that children in more urban areas oftentimes maybe have more access to kind of academic support. So I'm just wondering, has this been something that's been considered uh, or something that you're aware of? Thank you. Well, I'm not aware of uh, uh, the, 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 I, I imagine in rural areas there can be some uh, uh, issues of which are common to the delivery of all services, which may be around access and proximity. Um, but I, I'm not aware of any, any, any of the detail. Perhaps uh, Sarah might have some views on this or some of the, our, our yeah, colleagues. Again, I'll maybe ask Patricia to come in um, on this. Patricia herself is a former um, 
school leader in a rural area and, and recognises those uh, issues all too well. I don't believe there's been anything formal done um, in terms of uh, TSM in rural areas, particularly given the nature of how the TSM funding is, as, as the Permanent Secretary said, child dependent rather than area dependent. Um, so I don't believe that that in itself would have an impact. But I'm, I'm maybe going to ask. I'm looking at my microphone, but Patricia. I'm maybe going to ask Patricia if she might want to comment on that. Yes, Sarah, I would agree. Not not in terms of the TSN funding. Actually, that's very welcome because it allows you then to bring in additional resource, additional teachers, and teach in smaller numbers, etc. But Carrie, yes, there would be um, issues around maybe transport, farming, when children are not available because. They need to be working on the farm, etc. But these are all different contextual issues that the school principals and the primary principals and the post-primary principals would work very strongly together to ensure that you know you 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 make sure that the parent gets the child to school. You're following up very quickly when they're not in school. Um, in terms of transport, you know it's like everywhere across Northern Ireland when the snow comes, there may be snow days. I think though, Cara, those type of problems mm -hmm. will probably. Um, be reduced because of the learning over COVID when our remote learning policies and practices were really improved. So if a child is at home because of a snow day or because of transport, the remote learning can continue. Um, so not particularly, no, no no things coming through from the SIPs or, or to us, particularly in, in terms of the rurality. Thank you very much. No, that, that definitely clears up a number of questions that I had there. Just note that uh, large amount of my constituency is very rural and I'm sure other members will agree that there definitely is uh, the struggles with transport and things like that and weather um, impacts and the digital divide of course with Wi-Fi issues but no uh, I'm content thank you very much for being here today. Um, can, can I just ask a few questions there um, in terms of mental health and general well-being which uh, has, it was a huge issue in many con constituencies particularly acute of my own that has been um, exacerbated by the COVID pandemic and, and, the, and the issues connected with that in terms of the, the, the families, many working class and low income uh, family households in particular. Um, general well-being and mental health uh, issues are, are huge. Um, and I know from talking to school principals in my area, monies, and I've raised this with you both before, monies that are frontline education monies having to be redirected to buy in professional services to help young people with their, their mental health and general well-being coming out of the education budget. Now, sir, you said uh, that you support was enhanced and developed during the pandemic. I welcome that. But can you get an example of how that's happened in terms of working with the Department of Health? Um, <clears throat> Yes, I mean, absolutely. I think the Permanent Secretary made reference to the health and um, emotional well-being framework that was developed between both the Department of Education um, and the Department of Health, and I think that's been fundamental, if you like, in, in, in helping to bring that uh, forward. What I would say is that um, we have been working closely with the Public Health Agency right throughout the course of the pandemic and working closely with our colleagues in health so there have been a range of materials that have been developed for young people and all of that has been done in collaboration um, with our colleagues um, in, in health. Our youth service as well, as you will know, um, play a very significant role in this area and played a very significant role um, over the course of the pandemic and had some very targeted mental health initiatives, which again, many of which were cross-departmental and involved uh, justice as well as, as our colleagues in, in, in social care um, and health. So I, I, I think our ongoing and sustained links right throughout the pandemic allowed us to capture that across, um, across all of the, of the areas that we delivered. And therefore, anything that we were, if you like, driving forward or taking forward in that space very much had that health input. And again, things like the text the nurse scheme for children and young people was de developed in collaboration um, cross-departmentally. Chair, mm -hmm. sure, sure, could I maybe just make a, a comment on, on, on your point about uh, the education budget having to pick up all these other issues? Uh, I, mean, I think you're absolutely right. The fact is that schools 
uh, are based in, and are centred in communities. And obviously the pupils that come there come from the communities with all the issues that the community has. And it's critical, of course, that we work with other departments, as we do, to try and encourage them to uh, improve the delivery of services uh, in the community, whether it's, whether it's mental health or whether it's other uh, support for children and young people. But the reality is, and always has been, that when the young children come into school, if they are still uh, presenting with particular issues, the, the teachers and the principals simply have to deal with that because if they don't deal with that and aren't able to manage that and help the young people to manage that, the young people won't be able to learn and to develop. So, and that's why we have, for example, free school meals. That's why we are, we, we are delivering those kinds of programmes. I mean, education shouldn't be delivering meals uh, necessarily, but we do that because we know the benefit of children who, are, who have proper nutrition and, are, and are, are properly fed, who are able to concentrate during the day. Likewise, we need to pick up on any emotional and, 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 and mental health issues which haven't been addressed in, in, the, in the community. So I suppose it's, it's the two working together. We would like to see the balance, and I think this is the, the thrust of your point, slightly different, where more of it was being picked up by the other departments out there and therefore more of the education budget could be focused purely on education and learning. But I think there's always going to be an element within the education budget that's going to have to deal with those issues that still remain when the children mm -hmm. present in school. You both made mention of healthy, happy minds. Yeah. I presume that's a pilot. Can I ask where the pilot's being run uh, and how many skills and what the budget is? Well, I can answer some of those questions, Chair. It is, it is a pilot. It, 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 it came in, in response to uh, a number of uh, calls from a, a range of stakeholders uh, 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 to address the mental health needs that were presenting in primary schools. Uh, and originally, it was, it was presented as we need counselling in primary schools, as I mentioned earlier on. Yes. Uh, and our view was that Really, we need to think more broadly than that. We don't want to medicalise every single issue that a child presents with. We want to look and see what is the appropriate support and age-appropriate support. So it was broadened out into being uh, counselling and other therapeutic support. And I mentioned art, music, dance, drama, any of those kinds of activities that can help the children and young pe people. It is a pilot. It was launched on the 2nd of November. It will run to the end of this year. Uh, there's five million funding has been secured for this year. And... Um, what is being agreed is, is, is that if the funding, if the pilot doesn't progress, but some of the children are receiving support, there will be some transitional arrangement to ensure they continue to, to receive that support for some months afterwards. We wouldn't want everything just to come to a complete stop. There's £5 million pounds funding. Um, could you come back to the committee then with the schools involved in the geographical area? Do that, sure, yeah. And whether there's an urban uh, rural mix as well. Um, on, on that point, I sit on the, what is called the Shine Forum in Greater Shankill, North Belfast, where representatives from the Boys, Girls, Models, BRA and Hazelwood sit. There's also representatives of the um, primary schools, and th this is an issue which primary school principals have, ra have raised with me about young, young people manifesting, presenting themselves and manifesting um, issues around mental health and, and their general well-being, which is very worrying. Um, because it, it comes back to the point of, of early intervention being cheaper, but for the young people involved, for their family, for the schools, for their friends, the classroom, it's also more effective, uh, and, and uh, that's something which we need to, to bear in mind. Um, I think, Mr Beggs, you want to come in very briefly? Yes, uh, on the issue of, of well-being, um, when we visited uh, the boys' model, we briefly... Um, where I joined, joined a, a young class uh, where they have a well-being period. It's a regular feature. I have to say, very impressed with what, what I saw in that brief moment. But my question is, are you monitoring in any way to, to take the good practice from that? Uh, because uh, given the stress on this issue on, amongst many young people, it's something that perhaps should be widened out to every school if possible. So are you closely monitoring uh, what I consider to be a very successful uh, 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 a pilot that's been carried out there under their own initiative. Well, the, uh, Sarah mentioned the emotional health and wellbeing strategy, and, and, and through that and the activities within that, we'll be picking up on, on best practice, such as you've de described, and we can get that information through uh, the inspector and through uh, the services that are provided by the EA when they are, when they are in touch with schools. But I absolutely agree with you. Uh, the whole concept of well-being, and indeed, and uh, in, in some of the schools I visited, what they talked about was the importance of children being able to regulate 
to self-regulate, to regulate their behaviour, to deal with the ups and downs uh, that, that everyone has. Some children can cope with those better than others. And that whole sense of understanding about well-being, understanding things that sometimes can, can, can appear bleak. Things can, you can be anxious, you can be upset, but there are ways of dealing with that and teaching children and young people the strategies to deal with that and, and, and making them aware that this is normal. Uh, this is what everyone experiences, and providing the opportunity for them to talk about that, I think, is absolutely critical. And certainly, uh, uh, was something that I know that the, the schools that I visited spent a lot of time, uh, uh, like the Boys Model, like um, uh, Holy Cross, and uh, like Mercy College. So it, it is an, a really important, but and as you say, it has been exacerbated by what has happened during COVID. Finally, if I may, Chairman, uh, you mentioned about flexibility of the funding and it's up to schools to, to decide. However, we, we learned at Boys Model that they had to fight annually to get flexibility to make better use of their SEN funding. So we were advised previously that a pilot was being considered to formally look at that issue. But certainly, again, we thought we were picking up from the senior management team of the school how, they, how much they valued that flexibility and better value they felt they were getting it for the benefit of the young people. So how is the formal pilot developing, which was referred to by some of your colleagues previously? OK, if I may pick up on that. So you'll know that from the um, PSA recommendations, um, the department have commissioned an independent review of SEM processes, and one of that is around the use of... Um, of uh, classroom assistance, for example, and the effectiveness of that, um, and part of the flexibility that schools feed back to us to say that they that they would like more flexibility of is that they don't necessarily have to employ a classroom assistant and they can use other models. So I'm going to ask Michelle to speak through the pilot that we have. It's been a small pilot while we await the outcome of the more formal piece of research around the actual. Um, effectiveness of the model, um, because I think that's very important for us to anchor any of our further decision making off. But we have undertaken a small pilot um, in, this, in this area as we committed to doing. Michelle. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, uh, Chair. Our link officers work very closely with our schools in terms of on, on an individual need to maximise and tailor the support really that we need to give to those children with special educational needs and to use those resources effectively and efficiently to meet their particular needs. So if I was to use an example, a child in a class needs 10 hours classroom assistant and then a second child requires 10 hours, well, we would just employ one classroom assistant and then the children get access to a classroom assistant for their, for their full school day. But in terms of the flexibility, we try to build that in. And as Sarah has said, we started a pilot in an inner city school and, and it was to, to involve more schools. But then, of course, COVID uh, hit and that reduced our ability to do that. But the purpose really of the, of the pilot is to target literacy and numeracy, numeracy support for individual SEN pupils with qualified uh, newly qualified teachers. It's to promote team teaching and team mentoring in a whole class setting. It's to also embed the professional development of uh, newly qualified teachers and to use more experienced teachers as mentors and role models for them. And it's to give special educational needs pupils some pre-teaching of key lessons and experience higher levels of success in the class. And of course, one of its main purposes is, is to challenge, to, to deal with challenging behaviour and problematic attendance that we have heard mentioned here this afternoon. After uh, 18 months working with the school, we can say that the targeted pupils have increased their attendance and have reduced their challenging behaviours. The targeted pupils have increased their attainment across key subjects, including English and maths. There's been 100% buy-in from the staff on this whole school approach to supporting learners and indeed our most vulnerable learners. Newly qualified teachers, staff, parents and pupils have engaged in some very comprehensive evaluative exercises and the baseline data is being monitored for academic research uh, purposes. So the role of the classroom assistants in this pilot is definitely more clearly defined and understood in supporting the learning in class. I look forward to hearing the formal outcome. Um, so it's cynicism in your voice. Um, in terms of the, the um, 
comment that Mr. Beggs made about the well-being. I mean, I, I think the boys' model is working in collaboration with Streetbeat, uh, and that's working very well. I should declare an interest. I'm on the board of Streetbeat, but the, 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 those young people really were enjoying uh, that that session, and I think that that is something which is uh, innovative uh, and and is good for. Uh, the young people there, it's good for school, it's also good for street beat as well because it allows them as well because many of those young people will be working with street people uh, 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 in the evenings and uh, then they have a relationship there which really is important in terms of getting the maximum outcome. Um, I just wanted to, to put on record as well, I mean, you made mention of the youth service, uh, I attended the opening of the, the uh, really furbished Hammer uh, Centre in May uh, and I w was pleased to see that the, the Mark and Mark McBride and his team were working with some of the young people who were involved in the civil unrest in April. Uh, that work is uh, hugely hugely valuable, uh, and uh, they are to be commended for it. Uh, and we are appreciative of that work. Just a few questions then before we finish. Um, in terms of first start, if I could return to that, um, practically going forward, I suppose this question for you, um, um, Mark, in terms of. Going forward, talk is cheap, but it takes money to buy whiskey. If if um, if the first start report is to be implemented and make the change that everybody wants it to see, in particular Dr. Purdy and his team want to see, will the funding be and the resource be provided, not just by your department, but uh, across the education um, family and across government, because it does cut across government, as we know. Well, I think the first thing to say is that the first art report uh, what came from NDNA was commissioned by uh, the, the Education Minister and it's a priority for the department. Uh, a key part of that uh, report, as I mentioned earlier on, was the fact that it was taken to the executive for endorsement by the executive because we need the support of the executive to deal with this issue for all the reasons that you've described in terms of the other departments contributing, but also because we need the resource to actually put to this. Um, I mean, the funding for um, first art... Uh, for the second year would be 11 million and then as we get into the fifth year I think it's up to 77 million so it's 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 a significant um, commitment that is required uh, and that commitment from the executive and the fact that the first and deputy first will be seeking updates twice a year we think are important ways of, of ensuring that this remains on the agenda and, and, and is given priority. In terms of the hard question you asked about buying whiskey, uh, the question about whether or not the funding will be there, well certainly 4 million has been uh, put aside uh, for this year from the department's baseline in order to uh, allow a start around early actions. That is going to uh, help us with a review of Sure Start staffing. It's going to help us to make an earlier start on additional nurture units, some seven additional nurture units. It's going to help us to do some work with um, uh, the youth sector in terms of training up young people in some of the more disadvantaged areas, taking 15-year-olds, training them up as potential leaders, certainly as volunteers in their own area, and taking them through that programme. And it's also going to support uh, the provision of additional digital devices to those children that don't mm. have access to that, which was another important element of the report. So there's four very concrete actions that we're taking forward, and there are more. There are a number of other reviews. And they're happening now in behind it. They are, are being implemented before the end of this year. The funding right. is there for that. We're starting to implement yes, those. The funding is there for this, year. for this year. The funding is there for this year and the Minister has given a commitment um, that if, if the programmes are started uh, and people are, are employed, that the funding will, will be there for uh, mm. the next, uh, in, in the case of the youth one, for example, for two mm. years. But it is difficult because we're awaiting, as you know, a budget announcement with some sense of what that is telling us. I mentioned the pressures that we have, so we're going to have to make some hard decisions uh, as to whether or not we can we can fund Fair Start and if that requires us to stop other yeah. programmes and how we arrive at those priorities. My, so my view is that Northern Ireland PLC can't afford not to fund Fair Start. Well, I uh, welcome your support in that, Chair, because well, that, the, that, that would be our view. The, this uh, committee well. is, has unanimously taken that view during this inquiry. Everyone has said that. Um, the, but, the, but the reality is that um, that's, that goes back to the point I made earlier uh, in, in the committee, that there needs to be money brought to the centre uh, across uh, government to pay for, I'm not saying all of it's initially going to be able to be paid for, but to ensure that First Start actually uh, is funded and provides the difference it can and should make, because 
government needs to understand that those early interventions, as I've said, are cheaper and they're more effective and they're also more cost effective. And so for, the, for, for young people uh, on a range of issues, not just their education, but societal issues, that funding needs to be put in place. So I, you know, I'm making that point to you, but we will equally make that point, I assure you, to the head of the civil service when she comes in front of this committee, because, the, because this committee feels strongly around this issue. Um, it may be an educational uh, issue, and it may be something which is the primacy of the education committee, and we fully understand that it is. But in terms of this inquiry, we are absolutely of that opinion, and I would just assure you of that. But Chair, I, I welcome your support and support of the committee on that, and our minister has been meeting with other ministers. It's gone beyond the, the, the collective executive endorsements. have to meet with individual ministers uh, to talk through the first art report and to encourage yeah. their, their support. But I, I mean, I, I, you did say earlier on, I think, quoting you accurately, more needs to be done to reduce the differential. I agree entirely with that. And, and that's why I think Boys Model is a good example of it. Uh, so can I perhaps um, suggest that one of the things that, that might come out of this is that since we have visited Boys Model and the Audit Office has visited Boys Model and the Department Secretary has visited Boys Model and the Head of the Civil Service has visited Boys Model and the Minister recently visited the Boys Model, I think what's going on at the Boys Model, uh, as Mr. Mr. Beggs and Mr. Muir would, would attest as well, would be a very good exemplar of how it should be done and there are other schools, I'm on the board of the girls model, equally being done tremendously well. I visited Mercy College only a couple of weeks ago, tremendous work being done there. But that sort of uh, work that's going on would be a really good handbook for other schools that, that, that haven't hitherto been able to deliver in the way that those schools I've mentioned have. I, I, I agree, Chair, and I uh, just... On a minor point of, of, of accuracy, the, 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 um, the head of civil service had planned to go to uh, the, the boys model but had to cancel it and has, re has rearranged. But to your broader point about best practice, and I think it is the boys model, but it's beyond that. Uh, we have some, I mentioned some earlier examples of the, of the star case studies about schools that are doing well. We want to draw on best practice across a range of schools and yeah. make that available to spread best practice, and that's something that we'll be focused on going forward. Okay, I think all those members who wish to ask questions have had that opportunity. At this stage, I'd just ask Mr Donnelly or Mr Stevenson, TOA, if they would anything they wanted to. Oh, Chair, thank okay, Mr Stevenson, have you anything you would like to say? Or not? Nothing from me, Chair, thank you. Okay, with that then, um, can I thank you both very much for your attendance and... Um, you're, you're free to go. Thank you. Thank you as, Chair. as are you, Mr. Stevenson, as well. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thank you. Okay, members, uh, with your permission, then we'll go to closed session to discuss the evidence and we've just heard. Um, so, broadcasting, can you confirm? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is